You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram brass, but I am the center inside the placenta of mass. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast, rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus, but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again. This is the Counterflow Podcast. Hope you're doing quite well wherever you are as you hear this one. What a wonderful night of Pascha celebration we had here in town at the St. Andrew's Orthodox Church. I hope all of you who are listening who celebrate that had a wonderful Pascha and a great bright week here coming up as this show debuts, as it drops, as they say. Let me tell you, I do have the guest booked for the monthly Zoom call, the Zoom call that you can be a part of if you donate $5 or more per month at patreon.com slash counterflow. It is none other than friend of the show, David Gornoski. He's one of those people, when I ask around the people that are in this exclusive club, who do you want back on or who do you want on as the guest for the Zoom call? Like I said, David Patrick Carey was the answer to that question for a lot of you, but Another common answer was indeed David Gronoski. So he's been kind enough to give us his time. That will be happening. You know, how prepped am I here? I should have looked this up, but I can look it up so quickly as I speak to you guys that I will tell you the date. And that will be on Monday, the 24th of April at 7 p.m. Central Time. Monday, the 24th of April at 7 p.m. Central Time. Like I said, it'll be David Gronoski. I will be updating all of you who are a part of this club. I will just send you the Zoom link. And again, it's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a fun one. Lots of Q&A. It's basically for those of you who've not taken part in this, I will interview the guest for, geez, it's not really that long, maybe 10 minutes. And that usually jumps in quickly with the members taking part in the question and answer session. So it kind of jumps off from there. It's really good time. And so join up, join up and uh, join us that night when we do it. A lot of people, when I am on another show, when I am a guest on someone's show, I often get asked, what's going on with people within the libertarian movement becoming Orthodox, Orthodox Christians? It seems like there's some kind of trend. And at first I didn't think there was maybe, but it's obvious now that there is a decent amount of us that have traveled that journey from being a libertarian to becoming an Orthodox Christian. And I wanted to get into an episode of why we think that's happening and what's going on with that. What's the trend about? So I have two people close to me that like me have taken this exact journey. That would be friend of the show and multiple time guest now, Julie Mastrini and friend of the show and also multiple time guest now, Matt Erickson. Matt, of course, you guys know him from the King Pilled podcast, we get into it. It's interesting because Julie's trek through this journey is a little bit different than Matt. And Matt and I have a very similar path through libertarianism, the ANCAP world, the Mises style of libertarians, and Julie not so much. So it's interesting to kind of see how they compare and contrast basically. And yet we all ended up as Orthodox Christians. So we're going to get into that. I will say up front, I say this in the episode, This is not by any means, we're not looking to straw man libertarianism or knock libertarians, not at all, actually. We're just discussing why we found libertarianism attractive, what made us maybe shy away from it at some point, and then what led us to orthodoxy. It's a very good discussion. Matt and Julie are both very bright, and I know you're going to agree with that summation. Most of you already know that. So if they're new to you, then you're going to enjoy this conversation. If you already know these characters, well, I know you'll enjoy it as well. Let's get into it now. All right. Julie, good? Mm -hmm. You look real pretty, Matt. No, I'm talking about (laughs) Keep that in. All right. (laughs) Matt Erickson, Julie Mastrini. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Counterflow, my friends. Thanks, Thank Buck. you. Yeah. We'll do, do that awkward thing where it's like, I'll just say a blanket statement and y'all 
Uh oh, who says something back first? <laughs> um, I always try to jump on it quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you've got a talkative Italian to compete yeah, with, so it's we're gonna have to fight. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a passive Scandinavian, so oh. <laughs> Matt, congratulations. You are newly baptized. I am. Yes, it's been great. How, how has it been since? Have you noticed anything different? I know that might, to a, a secular person, that might sound like a strange question, but it's not. Have you noticed anything different since? Um, I've definitely noticed that I'm a lot more keenly aware of any time that I'm sinning or being tempted to sin. It's much more uh, immediately apparent to me. And really, it's not, uh, it, it hasn't been a dramatic change. It's been subtle, but I definitely notice it. And um, being able to, to fully participate in the liturgy, receive communion, mm -hmm. um, confession has been just a, just a huge, huge thing. I, I, did, I didn't really anticipate it being such a significant influence, um, but the ability to confess and it, it, it's just, it's kind of funny. It's one of those things that when you say it out loud, it kind of is like, well, duh. But being able to just um, get stuff off your chest and just, just put it out there. Um, for me, at least, I have this tendency to refuse to acknowledge something is real. And it's like, as long as I'm not acknowledging that it's real, it's not real. But as soon as I put it out there and, and put it into the, mm. uh, just mm -hmm. put it into the environment, suddenly it's real. And then, um, then I can deal with the fact that it's real and I can, I can actually manage it and, and do what I need to do with it. So yeah, I think confession has probably been the biggest thing so far. And, uh, and yeah, then just being very apparent of any time that I'm tempted to sin. And that might sound like something that might be like, oh, well, I, that doesn't sound pleasant, but it actually is very refreshing because it, it gives you, at least it gives me like a very clear, um, I guess to use the buzzword, it gives me a very clear praxis. It gives mm -hmm. me like a, a clear idea of how to move forward. It probably, this is just me thinking about this as you say it, I think it probably has something to do with the confessing part. Is it, is it like, well, if I do this now I've got to, yeah, I don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah very much. Yeah. I don't want to have to talk about this. I don't want to mm -hmm. have to tell my priest that I did this or thought this or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and it's, and it's not, it, but it's in like a like a like a kind of a wholesome, a, a productive way that it's like now suddenly I just have a lot less of a desire to do those things. It's easier to just have my to let my mind bounce off the thing rather than sit and linger on it. Mm -hmm. It's it's a spiritual accountability, and we were uh, Julie, you and I have talked about that a little bit. For those listening, uh, she comes from a Catholic background. And in Catholicism, uh, within that, with, with the, the confession within Catholicism is much different, almost to where there is no accountability. Talk about that. Well, yeah, it's like my experience of it is that it's very um, legalistic. Like you confess your sins to the priest. You go into a little dark room and there's a screen between you. So there's almost like a dehumanizing aspect to that. Like you're not actually face to face face with somebody in like a way that you would be naturally because of the screen um it's dark and almost kind of spooky in there it's a small little room and you confess and then um they say oh say 10 hail marys or say five our fathers and five hail marys and that's it so it's like this trans it's almost like a transactional like legalistic it's like you committed a crime and here's your sentence instead of like giving you guidance and having an actual conversation and that was the biggest difference that I noticed in orthodoxy with confession is like I have an actual conversation with my priest and I get guidance and feedback and it's more human and natural. And that also makes it less like scary to do it. I mean, nobody likes confessing their sins, I guess, but it's there was always like this element of like fearfulness to Catholic confession because it felt like, I don't know, like you weren't going to just speak to a loving father about the issues that are plaguing you. It's like, you're like condemned in this tiny room, you know, just weird. And it may, the, the dynamic that I hear there as you're talking about it is that it basically turns prayer into a, a sentence for a crime. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, mm. exactly. Mm. It's so strange. Um, 
And I don't know. I mean, I was young when I was Catholic. So this is my experience from being like a young girl. But that was really how it felt. Like you just lift out your sin and they give you your, they call it penance. Your penance is 10 Hail Mary, five Our Fathers, whatever it is. And then you just leave. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it feels off. Like a lot of things in Catholicism felt really off to me. And that's one of them. Did Do either one of you have something that you can look back upon prior to being Orthodox or maybe even when you first became a catechumen where you had a what you look can look back on now and say was a misconception about Orthodoxy where you thought something and now you're looking back like, oh, it wasn't that at all. Anything specific pop in mind when I ask that? Yeah, the, my first experience in Orthodox Church was in a rural dying town in Pennsylvania, and people weren't friendly. And they were very, and that I think had more to do with geography and it being the Rust Belt and people being like um, concerned about outsiders, I don't know, than Orthodoxy in general. So I thought like, oh, if this is how Orthodoxy is, then I'm not going to be Orthodox. But it was just that church, every other church I've been to super open, warm, welcoming, great community. Um, so that was, I, I, I often tell people who are like thinking about orthodoxy to go to, um, to just go to church. And, and I, but I feel confident that any church they go to in this country will be warm and welcoming. And I, my experience, my first experience was an outlier for sure. So. For me, there wasn't anything specific necessarily, but a, my general trajectory into the church was there's just this phrase that I've been hearing a lot now that I read my way into the church. So it was mm-hmm. a very uh, philosophical intellectual exercise for me at first. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't a spiritual experience really. It was more of a, it was a, it was a head experience. It wasn't a heart experience. And it, I didn't, I, I kind of knew very early on that this was going to be the case that, that there was this, the, the, the heart element to it, but it didn't really get real for me until Lent this year. Mm. Prior to that, it was actually, it was kind of hard to uh, spiritually connect with everything, which was, that was a me thing. That wasn't an orthodoxy thing. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't realize it either. I was, you know, I was very happy attending church and, and, and being involved in the community and everything is, was great, but then I started realizing I'm only engaging with this stuff intellectually. I'm not, hmm. I'm not actually engaging it with my heart. And I don't know if that, I don't know if that connects to someone who hasn't gone through the experience. I don't know if that really makes any sense to people. But uh, over the last six, eight weeks, it's definitely become much less intellectual and much more. I, I haven't been listening to podcasts and and consuming all of the knowledge nearly the way that almost I've almost stopped completely and that time that I normally would have spent doing that has been spent a lot more time in 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 you, you might call it I don't know if I would necessarily say prayer more just kind of contemplative thought but that can get prayerful as you're as you're going through that process um so yeah that would be the probably the biggest thing for me as I came in as I was very compelled by the historical case, by the coherence of the philosophy, um, all of that sort of thing. So it was a very, um, it was a very heady exercise for me, but it's, it's started hitting me in the soul lately. Buck and I have talked about how um, a lot of people come into orthodoxy. They almost have like a political journey that then starts to mesh with the spiritual. But because, and mine was kind of like this. Um, where my politics were changing and like leading me to different places. So it was that like philosophical, intellectual exercise that led to orthodoxy. But some people take that path and then they come into the church. And I've noticed with some converts, it's like one thing that needs to be kept in mind is that orthodoxy isn't just about like being based. Like they find this um, faith that also agrees with their views on the degeneracy of the modern world. And then their expression of faith can be a little too much about like being right. Somebody sent me something that said that like the longer you're Christian, um, it should be about like, oh, my love for others is deepening and growing, not I'm, I have the correct views on everything. That makes sense. So that, that shift from like head to heart 
Mm -hmm. it starts to kind of integrate the longer you're in orthodoxy. It's like, it's not about being right or having the right political views or whatever. Um, Something that Cyprian said on the last time I had him on, on actual episode was, do you want to be right or do you want to get it right? Mm. And, and that phrase has stuck with me. You know, there's, I have to imagine he got gleam some of that from Father Turbo because it just is yeah. such a great thing. Not that Vin couldn't think of that himself, but um, that, that phrase, I think, kind of sums up what Julie's getting at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's Julie, humility thing. Yeah, no kidding. It is that. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Father Turbo, to speaking of him, also said on my show something that a lot of people gave me feedback, like, man, when he said this one thing, to also address what you're saying is people get into it because of the exotic aspect or it's not like the Christianity I grew up with and because it's anti this, it's anti that. Oh, it's based. And then what happens when it becomes anti you? Mm. And yeah. that, when he said it, it like punched me in the gut a little bit. And I was like, oof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's when yeah, a lot of good. those type people that are just in it to be right or, or based mm -hmm. or whatever are like, well, I think I'm going to stop going to church as much and then I'll be just online ortho bro. And, um, that becomes yeah, an issue. Yeah, people that only experience orthodoxy online, which I that isn't even the right way to say it because you're not experiencing orthodoxy if you're just engaging with it online. But it becomes a matter of the head, right? And so much of the good stuff of orthodoxy is experiential. It's like the, it's mind and body and soul. It's not just mind. So if you're just online reading orthodox stuff and talking about orthodoxy, it's really not the full expression of the faith you uh you it's like you knew you wanted to help me transition into the broad topic that we're going to get into because you talked about your political journey and i, I i'm familiar with both of y'all's journey and it's interesting you both went through libertarian uh libertarianism in different different parts of it matt is much more into or was into the 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 circles that I was in and the, the right-wing Mises, Rothbardian, Hans Hermann Hoppe, um, anarcho-capitalist area of libertarianism. And Julie um, wasn't as familiar with those kind of people. And your sister Amy was what we um, maybe affectionately called within my circles a beltway libertarian uh, working in DC. And and you guys were kind of in with the fee crowd, um, Foundation for left Economic... Left libertarian. Mm -hmm. I would call it left libertarian, but you know, I'll let you call it what you will. Um, so before we get to Matt, because he's detailed his, his journey on the show, but I, I want him to get into it as well. But yours is so different than his and mine. And it's funny that we all end up at the same kind of space uh, that we're in now. But go ahead, Julie. Oh, well, do you want me to describe the Why, space what, as what, I was in? What an, yeah, initially, where were you? You were a left-wing feminist, and then you found libertarianism. What what did that look like? Why did you get attracted to the liberty movement at that time? Yeah, I was like a socialist, anarchist, um, left-wing feminist, like almost like Bernie Sanders type of philosophy, right? And in college. And then um, I just, my, a good, I, I mean, I think something that really changes us and has a big impact on us are our relationships, right? So I had a, have a best friend from my youth um, and we went to the same college and she started getting in with this libertarian crowd and they were thoughtful people and they had a really different take on things. In fact, I was at a, what, what is it called? The Democratic Socialists of America meeting. It's a real left-wing group. And a libertarian showed up to our meeting and started debating the professor who was, <laughs> um, that tracks. who was running. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at this guy and being like, I don't know what he's talking about, but he sounds smart. <laughs> and they were going back and forth about, I think they were kind of arguing about whether or not the source of our societal problems is the state or the corporations or like something like that. Um, and he was just really intriguing. So then my friend started in college um, getting in with, um, sorry, there are dogs barking, um, with the libertarian crowd. And I trusted her. We were friends from childhood. And so I'm like, well, what's she getting into? And I started messaging her boyfriend at the time, who was a big libertarian, and asking, like, well, what do libertarians think about the minimum wage? What do they think about this? And he sent me a book by Jason Brennan. And I um, read that, and it was just kind of the basics. And I think I liked libertarianism because it felt more logical and coherent about economics. 
Like you could still like markets and capitalism and, 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 but then I also retained my sort of feminist left wing social views. So it allowed me to go like as right as I could go and at the time and feel like I was being more logical about our economy, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And and I forgot as you were speaking there, um, I'll let Matt get into his story as well, but Matt was a Bernie bro himself. And I, I, I'd forgotten (laughs) about that. What, where were you with all of that, Matt? Uh, Like I said, you were a Bernie guy. I know that, but what initially attracted you to libertarianism? So I, I, I was a, a Bernie guy, which was kind of funny because it was very far removed from my upbringing. And I think that might've been part of the reason why I was, I was in that direction. It was really, I was, if I was a Bernie guy for a period of time, I would have been a single issue Bernie guy. And it was, it was student loans. I was in trouble. Yes, me too. (laughs) I heard this, this kooky old guy who was going on and on about student loans and how unjust they are. And I'm like, I'm getting out of like financial aid meetings where I'm just, I'm like, I'm being, having my arm twisted into taking on astronomical amounts of debt. This just seems completely corrupt and crooked. I remember buying uh, textbooks and the the freaking racket that textbooks yeah. are in college where they <laughs> it'll be one textbook will be like $780 and they have an edition each year and the only thing that changes is they tweak a little stuff around the margins but the textbook will you'll purchase the textbook and it's shrink wrapped and if you take the shrink wrap off then trying to re- like sell it back to the library or resell it somewhere you might get you know 20 bucks for it God. So you're having to, in one class, I remember like the one year, so one, one quarter for me, my textbooks cost like $3,500 for <laughs> one quarter. Oh, God. And I was like, this is, this is criminal. This is just, an, this is a racket. And so hearing Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren talk about this, if this would have been like 2010-ish, hearing them talk about this stuff was very compelling to me. And so I wanted to be able to make that economic case better. I wanted to, I didn't, I, I felt like I didn't want to be the, 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 the bratty child who's just like, ah, I don't want to pay for this stuff. I wanted to be able to actually make like a coherent economic case. So my dad had been a Gary North guy for a while. He'd been following Gary North. And so I heard about Tom Woods through him. And I did a paper in college on, for a research writing class I was like, I need to write something. And I was like, I want to write something that's smart and edgy. So I wrote a research paper on uh, the gold standard and uh, tied mm. it into Nazi Germany and the effects of, of uh, uh, inflationary monetary policy on, and, and totalitarian governments. And so I'm like, I'm writing this paper while at the same time, I'm also like, this Bernie Sanders guy really knows what he's talking about. And uh, so from that, I got exposed to Tom Woods and it was a couple years later, I kind of got out of the, that whole thing and I got into sports and kind of was doing other stuff. And then I had a, a long commute for, for several years and wanted to listen to stuff. I started getting into listening to audiobooks and podcasts and stuff. So I went through the whole Tom Woods, uh, uh, track of things and listened to all the economics in one lesson, all the different Murray Rothbard books, Hoppe did that whole thing. And I went from essentially kind of a, a like a single issue Bernie bro type to a at least a, a rabid Rothbardian hand cap over the course of probably 18 months something like that mm-hmm. yes yeah, student debt radicalized me as well like it, it felt so unfair that's how it I is. got into politics it is yeah and was, and it is yeah yeah they're they're the different prescriptions on how to fix it is always of course the issue um also I, sh- I want to say this before we dive further, this is not a blanket knock on libertarians as people. This is not a judgment against any of that. Um, it's just discussing um, mutual kind of paths, experiences, why we got into things, why we got out of things. Um, so I, I know this is a subject, that, honestly, it's a subject that a lot of listeners of mine feel and understand. And then I know there's some listeners that are, I don't want to think people to think like we're just knocking people and making fun of something because we disagree with a political philosophy or whatever. So having said that, um, there is this, I fought the fact that this exists for a while because people always talk about pipelines and the alt-right, libertarian alt-right and these kind of things around the Trump election. And, but there does seem to be some sort of libertarian 
to Orthodox Pipeline. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the three of us, or at least Julie's path there has been different maybe than Matt and myself. But what do you think attracts, I get this asked uh, a lot to me, what do you think attracts libertarians to Orthodox Christianity, uh, Matt? I think probably the first thought that comes to mind is as a libertarian, you're already kind of situated outside, or at least you perceive yourself as outside the system. And you, you, you perceive yourself as the person who sees the thing that nobody else sees, the thing that's right in front of us, but nobody else is, is noticing it. Yeah. And there's a very similar dynamic to that with orthodoxy. So it, it's, um, you're you're kind of already primed to 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 have that mindset to view the world that way, um, and then my guess is that it would probably be everyone's probably going to have a different experience, kind of a different story. For me, it was it was kind of uh, it, it seemed almost like happenstance. I just happened to kind of come across people at the right time. Obviously, in hindsight, I know it's not, but <laughs> um, it. I think as you're as you're a libertarian, kind of trying to grapple with these issues and solve these issues, you you start off kind of more thinking more locally, at least locally within the, the American borders. And you start like, well, how do we solve this problem? Oh, well, okay, well, now that I see this problem, there's all these other problems out here that that problem brings up. So now how do we come up with a solution that, that's like an umbrella that covers all of those issues? And as you start to think about that, then, well, here's all these other issues out here. And so you get um, both conceptually and geographically, you're, you start thinking broader and broader. And as you start, at least for me, as I began recognizing what the system of liberalism is, began recognizing that libertarianism is not outside the, the three by five card of allowable opinion, to borrow a phrase, um, that it's actually on, it's still on that, that three by five card. Um, I think it, 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 for me, was probably a matter of history, a combination of history and becoming aware of global issues a lot more and starting to see, because uh, obviously orthodoxy, so to this point, really, orthodoxy is still pretty young in America. I mean, the first orthodox church came to America in the 17, late, mid, mid, late 1700s, um, but it hasn't made major cultural inroads in the United States to this point. That's really kind of starting to pick up now. For the most part, people don't even know what it is. When I first was exposed to it, was it two years ago now? I, to me, I'd never even really heard of it. And my perception of it was that these are just kind of like weird looking Catholics with beards. <laughs> and once, once I became aware of it, then suddenly I, I, I couldn't stop seeing it. I started, I started recognizing it everywhere or at least recognizing the absence of it. You start, you realize that there's a void that this thing fills. And then for me, it was the historical context of it, watching the, the development, the evolution of, of ideas back to, I went back to the Reformation and then realized that the Reformation was kind of the outworking of, of stuff that had happened before that. So I went back further. And so I don't know really for, for most libertarians, I don't know if they take the historical trajectory or if they take the, the geographic trajectory. I don't know what it is that clicks with them, but I think probably the root of it is... Um, what I said about it being a an outside perspective, and you're already primed to take on an outside perspective and kind of be the weird one in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that that makes a lot of sense. What do you what do you think, Julie? Um, so for me, it was more so that as a left libertarian, all of my social views were on the left, and it was very like live and let live. And even if it, something doesn't work for you, maybe it's fine for somebody else. And that kind of um, in, that individualist attitude about how our social mores ought to be. And I lived that out and I watched other people live that out. Like these were people that were very into like, um, like open relationships and like um, drug, drugs should be legal and this and that. And the whole philosophy of individualism um, and living that out in your social life. Um, and also seeing the impact on other people who were living out that philosophy. Um, it made me see that if you don't have an, uh, that, that, okay. And this connects to the political, like if you aren't internally self-controlled, 
in your morality because you're beholden to God, um, then, uh, then it invites state tyranny. Like uh, A.G. Barr gave a really good speech on this where the founding fathers gave us broad freedom because our constitution was written for a religious people. Because if you're uh, controlling your own behavior because you know that God sees you, then you can have broad freedom in society. But if you're not willing to do that, the society falls apart and then you need the state to tamper down. So I saw this living in San Francisco where yeah. in, in two sort of realms, one was like the homelessness issue and people, and there's open air drug markets in San Francisco. So people are sleeping on the sidewalks, defecating on the sidewalks, shooting up on the sidewalks, um, you know, littering on the sidewalks, all these things. And with the like live and let live attitude, libertarianism has no answer for that. It makes the streets less safe. Women certainly are less safe. You can't have children on those streets because there's needles everywhere. But libertarianism has no answer for that because they're just living their life and drugs should be legal and they're not violating the nap. They're not violent against anybody. So looking at that, I was just like, well, certainly like, uh, and, and then you like certainly uh, you need some sort of mechanism for people to control their behavior if you don't want the state to tamper down on people, right? And these are complex problems, but um, it was that. And then also just looking at the lives of people who were living out their libertarian philosophy, especially in the realm of like romantic relationships. Um, I was around a lot of like relationship anarchists and people who were in open relationships. And the whole philosophy of that is very libertarian because it's like, well, I'm just going to do like what's right for me and you do what's right for you. And, um, and if I want to, and I am just gonna, we'll give each other freedom. Freedom's our highest value. So we'll sleep with whoever we want, or if we want to pursue other relationships, that's fine. That's fine. And how much that like hurt people. So for me, it was like the looking at how libertarianism gets rid of like boundaries around your behavior and how those boundaries actually like shape society into something, um, nice, (laughs) um, that primed me to accept religion because, um, religion encourages you to control yourself that way, right? <laughs> Under God, right? It's not a state authority telling you, no, you can't do this and that, right? It's, um, you want to have a good relationship with God and then that, that you know, modifies your behavior and shapes you. Uh, so that's how I ended up there from like libertarian to religious. There is so much awful propaganda aimed directly at your children. With these two books I'm about to tell you about, you can at least help open up their mind to better ideas, not these crazy, progressive, poisonous, toxic ideas. My sponsor, Ollie Adamson, has created two wonderful children's picture books. The first one is called Strawberries Are Red, a story about compelled speech. It was inspired by a work policy restricting the use of gender pronouns during performance reviews. Leftist ideologies, and you guys know this, are heavily subsidized and continually thrust upon our youth by the media and in their schools, unfortunately. There's never discussion of ideas that occurs, and that's by design, right? Because they know their ideas will lose in an open discussion. These books promote conversation between parent and the child and incrementally tip the scales toward reasoned discussions of the topics at hand. The other topic we're going to talk about here in this ad, this book is called You're Not Welcome, a story about segregation. Sound familiar over the last few years? This was inspired by a work policy that actually placed Ollie, the author, on unpaid leave for five months due to medical mandates, we'll call it. This story presents and uses racial segregation as a backdrop before moving on to the issue of medical segregation and these policies that we all saw over the last few years. It takes no position on the safety or effectiveness of either masking or jabbing, but instead focuses on coercion that was used to achieve the establishment's goals. You can check these books out at ollieadamson.com. That's O-L-L-I-E, Ollie, and then adamson.com. They're also on Amazon. So once again, the books are called Strawberries Are Red, a story about compelled speech, You're Not Welcome, a story about segregation. I'm so proud to do an ad for Ollie, and I'm really glad he's sponsoring this show because these are very great books to get the young one in your life. Let's get back to the show. 
there's, there's three thoughts there that that Go ahead. Uh, that you sparked for me. Um, okay. The first one is actually well, the kind of the more kind of straightforward one. I, I I realized as I was as I was talking that out that there was a, a major thing that I overlooked, which is that um, I I think my my suspicion is that a, a major uh, we might call it like a uh, a base camp on the journey from libertarianism to orthodoxy is monarchy. Yeah, that there's there's a there's a libertarian to monarchist pipeline, especially on the if you're a right wing libertarian, really interested in in economics and trying to figure out how to engineer the proper system to make society function well, um, in a very autistic way, um, which I, I very much self identify with, um, then <laughs> monarchy is a natural kind of a natural uh, uh, angle for you to start taking, especially if you read some Hoppe or that kind of thing, which is a little ironic because obviously Hoppe is not necessarily an advocate of monarchy, and I'm well aware of that. So. Um, the, the Spurgs can stop typing. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, and uh, there's a lot of us that have that bus stop. We get off the stop at Minchus Mold Park, yeah. uh, Curtis Yarvin. And, and that's very, I've seen that with, actually I've seen it with a lot of us that end up as Orthodox people, but yeah, go ahead, right. go ahead Matt. The, mo- the monarchy thing is uh, the, the little quip that I've said for a long time now is that the, um, the distance between, or the, the only difference between monarchy and anarchy is a single bullet. And <laughs> that, when that kind of clicked for me, I was like, hmm, so maybe these two things aren't quite so far apart, actually. Maybe, you know, there's, there's, maybe there's a little sum to this monarchy thing. And then Moldbug obviously really helped that. And that's what sparked my, my, my uh, more study into history. Um, but something else you were saying, Julie, about the way that the state cultivates degeneracy. The state intentionally cultivates degeneracy because that creates the pretext for it expanding its own power. There's actually a term for this. A friend of, friend of the show here coined an idea called archotropism our mm-hmm. friend uh, popular liberty andrew from popular liberty uh he coined this term archotropism using uh the uh, i think it was like the laws of thermodynamics to interpret the development of state power and he pointed out how the state has an incentive to promote degenerate things like these libertarian concepts of live and let live because that degenerates the other systems that hold power in the society that are bulwarks against state intrusion. So if yeah. you allow those systems to be degenerated, then the state is going to step in and fill those, those vacuums. And it, I think it's, it, it shouldn't take very long for someone who's really seriously studying and looking into these issues to recognize that the state is far more than just people who get a government salary, that it's, it's right. a lot more of a of a complex nuanced thing than that the state really becomes you you mentioned julie like the 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 distinction between the one the people who care about the state and the people who care about the corporations and you kind of get to the point where you realize that this is the, these are the same people it's the same people that just have different job titles but they're flowing seamlessly back and forth between these and that the the state is actually more of a um it's more of a spiritual entity almost that that occupies different institutions mm. and the the one of the biggest aha moments that, that clicked for me a couple couple years ago maybe is that um, individualism, which was once a good thing to me, which was once like something to strive for, I began recognizing as actually a, um, an insidious evil. And this isn't to say that the individual doesn't exist or doesn't have value. I'm meaning individualism as a philosophy. What I realized through, I, I think I've mentioned this on this show before, so you could, you could probably watch one of the other episodes where Buck and I talked about this, but um, the, what liberalism, broadly speaking, as a political philosophy did is it eventually got to the point where um, it evolved. It, it was an evolution of, of Christianity, really, beyond the Reformation. It got, it got to the Reformation, and then uh, Moldbug points this out, that the Reformation just continued. It continued up through the social gospel and and to the point where it actually a modern American culture is essentially like a degenerate Protestant Christianity that has reformed Christ right out of the church. Yeah. But you couldn't reform Christ out of the church and not replace him with something. And so what it replaced him with was the individual. And the individual is not, if you, if you hear people talking about the individual in libertarian circles, they don't talk about actual individuals. They talk about a conceptual individual, like a hypothetical individual who they, they're imagining a hypothetical, properly functioning society where this 
abstract concept of the individual is allowed to fully flourish. And I, I think that, that that individual is not real. But I think that that individual is almost like a, like a spiritual entity that has possessed the minds of modern people. Yes. And it has all many of the trappings of Christianity. It, it passes itself off as Christian, but it's actually, it's, it's literally anti-Christian because it is in the place of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that may be, there may be something, we're kind of talking around this issue a little bit. I think this may be one of the things that, uh, that for a lot of these people, they, they, they make this progression from libertarianism to monarchy to then recognizing that even monarchy, even a, even a king is actually a, um, is, is almost like a, a clergy role. The king has a, um, a role, a spiritual responsibility for the people. It's a position of spiritual leadership. And true kingship is modeled after the true king. So once that was, I mean, this has been the progression for me is recognizing the inevitability and the necessity of having a king, whether you call him a king or not, having the role of a king, and then recognizing that an effective, proper king will reflect the, the true king. And then that's how the true king is manifested into our societies through that role. Well put. Julie, you, yeah. I know you have some thoughts coming out of that. No, no, he's, no. <laughs> he's said it. No, I can't he's, follow that. <laughs> he said all the things. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was good. <laughs> there was, so for Matt and myself, I would say this journey, um, we talked about the pit stop of, of Mencius Moldbug and, and uh, neo-reactionary uh, elements and things like that. We both kind of got into that for a bit. Yours, out of libertarianism, you, Julie, well, I don't want to speak for you. I'll let you speak for yourself. Where did you go after you thought, I don't, I don't find myself at home as a, in libertarian uh, ink, as it were? I mean, I guess I went to like traditionalism and conservatism. Like I became... On is the right. Well, I, well, actually, wait. No, I had to mm -hmm. stop in like the IDW space, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Um. So Jordan Peterson was, yeah. I, I skipped the step. Yeah. So Jordan Peterson was like coming on the scene, and he helped me to be more like to bend towards Christianity a bit, um, because the way he would speak about the Bible and things, I just I'd never heard anyone speak like intelligently about the Bible. Um, and then he was kind, of, and he kind of melds in things about like. Jungian archetypes and things like that that really resonated with me because um, they have that spiritual angle. And so, yeah, and then I was kind of, yeah, I stopped in the IDW space, but um, it was a short stop there, I think. And it's almost hard to pinpoint exactly why. I think because it's kind of classical liberalism there. Or, yeah. I don't know. Is, I, is, I, and, is your hero still to this day, Dave Rubin? No, I'm joking. <laughs> but he helped me to start to um, be exposed to like dissident voices. And there was a lot going on in the culture. Like I remember he interviewed James Damore, who had been smeared by the media and fired from Google for writing a memo that spelled out some differences between men and women and why women aren't in engineering positions, which is a very reasonable memo and um, just got totally smeared and Dave Rubin interviewed him. And so like that started making me go, OK, well, wait a minute, like, you, you know, obviously um, these beliefs I have are not like tracking with reality. Um, but I ended up finding that space insufficient. And it's hard for me to, I don't know if I've ever really thought about why. I just sort of like naturally moved on from it. And I think a lot of people did mm -hmm. um, and found it lacking. I don't know, maybe one of you can speak more to why if you're familiar with what I'm talking about, but. Um, it is interesting that I, I completely glossed over it in myself as well, but Jordan Peterson was a major, major influence on me. He was a, a Same. significant Same. reason for me returning to the church. He was the Same. hearing, the way I perceived him was, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I perceived him was like a, um, like the best of the secular world interpreting scripture through the purest secular lens and drawing the same conclusions yeah. in, a, in a broad sense. I was like, it was the, the, the way I formulated it in my head before was that he was pointing out that these archetypal truths 
are are true whether they're tr- whether they're factually true or not. So if they're factually true, they're true. If they're if they're not factually true, they're still like archetypally true. So then there must be a greater truth. There's like a there's like a meta yes. truth that yeah. that they really uh, um, that he was really driving at. And it's interesting that because I think it's probably in part because he's he's kind of uh, gone off the deep end, so to speak. But he was a major influence on a lot of people, I think, as well, who were kind of making this same sort of journey where you had a lot of people who were libertarian inclined and yeah. you, you don't want to be, especially if you're kind of coming from the, from the beltway side, I'd imagine you don't want to be associated with the, with the, uh, the unwashed masses in the same, you know, the, 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 the Mises plebs and stuff like you want to be used. There's something about the IDW people that were all, they're very, um, kind of prim and proper and, and, uh, classy uh, of sorts. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so there was, there was an appeal there where like, these are dissidents, but these aren't like, like, like rowdy yucky dissidents these are these are the um the the prim and proper dissidents and this is i'm speaking in like the you know kind of 2016 to 2018 time frame um and then they they pretty quickly revealed themselves to be um lukewarm milk yeah. toast um <laughs> and so a lot of us at least for me and a lot of the people that have been in, in my circles for the last little while we wanted more we wanted more of what the, the IDW crowd was starting to hint at or starting to point to, particularly uh, Jordan Peterson. And so then it was, you know, through Jordan Peterson, you get Jonathan Pajot um, for a lot of yep. people. And that was a that was a big deal that he got he got put on a lot of people's radars. And then you start you start thinking about the world in in the more um, archetypal way. And I think that that recognizing archetypes, um, like Julie, you said you said Jungian, and that that got me uh that got me all excited because that's that's right in my uh, right in my wheelhouse. Recognizing the the existence of archetypes is, uh, I think that that's kind of like a shortcut into uh, recognizing and acknowledging the the eternal presence of the spiritual world within the material world. Uh, as soon as you realize that that, that that there are archetypes and the way that archetypes function, then you can't stop seeing and you can't stop recognizing them. And you realize that these things are, they're not real in the way that, you know, like this can of soda is real, but they, they're almost more real. So if, if a spiritual thing, like an archetype can be more real than the, the physical thing that my hands are touching. All right. Now I want to explore this. I want to explore this world. I want to know more about it. And that's probably, that was probably a big, uh, I haven't even really thought about that enough, but that was probably a really big influence on me in that direction. Julie, you can respond if you want. <laughs> no, I, I, that, that was a big, that was a big thing for me as well, was reading about Jungian archetypes. And like you said, it's entirely metaphysical, but you can just see it manifest, right? The like spirit of the archetype in different people or stories or whatever it is. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and digging into that really, yeah, help, like help me to accept the like, that there are higher realities, right? That are influencing this realm. Um, and I'd always been spiritual, but not, well, no, not always, but um, up to this, that point I'm speaking of, um, I had been spiritual, but kind of following like the more like new age sort of Buddhist path, which doesn't offer archetypes actually, like um, Buddhism and I was kind of like a new age Buddhist type. And it's all, it's all about um, non-attachment. So you're actually sort of disidentifying with any sort of like uh, role or like um, mode of being in the world. Like I would sit on my yoga mat and meditate and try to like let my thoughts go, right? And, and just um, let go of any attachment to the world. But then you have to get off the mat and like go be in the world. It's like, where is Buddhism offering any model for how to relate to others or how to be a good person, right? Whereas then I was looking at Christianity. It's like, you have Joseph and Mary and what did they do? you know, in this situation, right? Like, how do they respond to what was going on in their lives? You know, like it offered actual real human, like models um, of behavior, which Buddhism wasn't offering. And a lot of the, and they were archetypal, right? Um, I started to think of, you know, Mary as archetypal mother and, you know, all these things. So it was kind of a, looking into Jungian psychoanalysis stuff was kind of like, 
a gateway for me back into Christianity as well. And I attribute Jordan Peterson's influence to that. And you grew up Catholic, like we mentioned, when you were wanting to venture back into Christianity. What what was it first? Oh, well, first I went back to Catholicism. Well, yeah. So I was, wait, <laughs> first I was like, I need a church. I need a community of like-minded people who are meeting together every week and have rituals and traditions. And I first ended up at a psychedelic art church because I was coming out of New Age, but was kind of Christian. Yeah. And so this was in upstate New York. And um, they were very like, all religions share the same mystic core. They're all the same. And they even have a visual they place everywhere where it's all the different symbols of different religions in a circle. Right. So, mm. so, and then I started to notice in the culture surrounding that church, I don't think it's a real church anymore. All the same problems I saw in San Francisco, the open relationships, the, you know, the degeneracy, people were mentally unwell, they were depressed, this and that. And there was no coherent dogma for people to follow to order their lives. And I was like, okay, now I need a church where Christ is at the top. If it's not Christ centered, it doesn't work. Like it doesn't function and it doesn't allow people to like have a good life. People weren't forming families. There were no children at these churches. A lot of people were doing drugs, right? It wasn't like a good family environment. I was like, okay, so it's not generative. Like the lack of a presence of families and children told me that it wasn't generative. So something's off with their whole philosophy and their spirituality, even though it was a very spiritual place. Um, you need that dogma and that you need like, lo I feel like it was lacking logos and I don't even know if I can expand on that, but um, because I didn't have Christ at the top. So um, then I went back to Catholic churches and I was like, well, that's what I was raised and let me go back to Catholic church. And I had had one experience visiting a friend in Virginia and she took me to an Anglican Catholic church. Um, Buck, your priest is a former Anglican Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I had never been exposed to Anglican Catholics. It was Matt's a small priest church is too. Oh, wait. Yeah. The same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he, yeah. So, um, I was excited when he said this because my friend had taken me to an Anglican Catholic church and I noticed something that was totally lacking my whole life in Catholicism was a sense of community. Meaning after you take the Eucharist and, you know, participate in, we call it mass. People just ran off and went home. Some people would even take communion and then immediately leave. Like they didn't even stay for the closing hymns and things like that. And at the Anglican Catholic Church, they had a coffee hour and people got together and chatted and, you know, had, had food and drink. And I really liked that because I was also thinking a lot about the problems of social atomization, which is a whole other podcast is you know, how we all go to college and then we move for a job, right? And we're like ordering our lives around being economic units and that we don't have community or we have to like reforge a community and and then the urban environment and what that does to us. Anyway, that's a whole different topic. So I was thinking about <laughs> the problem of social atomization and I needed a church. And then I was like, okay, wh which one? So the Anglican Catholic showed me that you can have a Christ-centered church and community. And the Catholics had the Christ-centered church and not a sense of community. And also the mass felt flat, like it still had this element of like, almost like cringiness, where it was hard to sit through. Like you, you, that's why people leave so quickly after they take communion. It's like, oh, I'm dumb. Oh, I gotta shake this off. Because the whole time it just feels <laughs> like, it feels like stiff and blocked up. And like something isn't like, it's not this like, like the, or, the Orthodox liturgy, when I encountered that, it felt like this like, the only I, I don't even know how to put it into words, but it felt like this like flowing, like um, holistic thing, like experience. <laughs> and because um, it's outside Catholic, space and time is is yeah, is what it is. And yeah, there is no and, constraints or, or, or yes. blocked up weirdness that you were saying. Well, right, because the Catholic Mass is like we sing this hymn and then we pause and then we say this and then we do and it's very like da, 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 and you're even like sit stand sit stand and it's all very like. Da, 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 da. I, I don't even have like uh, eloquent words for this, but it's it just the experience of it is painful. And so anyway, people on Twitter were telling mostly my, my sister actually to look into orthodoxy and we finally uh, started looking into that. But you, uh, you gave me a bunch of thoughts throughout that. Um, cool. One of them was you, <laughs> you said, uh, you're, you're trying to think of a word for this, this, this flowy thing. And one of the yeah. words that I've used before for, for orthodoxy in general, but I think this would apply to the liturgy. Um, it's funny, I see these microcosms and macrocosms everywhere. Um, speaking of archetypes, uh, you have the word I've used for orthodoxy is that it's like a tapestry. It's like a, a, a beautiful tapestry 
where uh, every part all fits together. And if you don't have one part, you don't, you, the whole thing doesn't work. But if you have, wow. you have all the parts together, then you get the full picture. And that's kind of how the liturgy is as well. You don't have the, like the, a conversation, okay, well, so precisely at what, what word is it that the priest says that, that turns it from, uh, from uh, bread and wine into the body and blood? Like, is it, is it this, this point or is it this point? No, you, you can't extract one part of the service from the rest of it. It's the whole service all together, cohesively, collectively. Yeah. Um, That's a brilliant thought. The yeah. other thing was the, uh, we, were, we, we used the word degeneration or degeneracy. There's a word that goes around a lot. And it's something I've been pondering. Did, if you're talking about degeneration, what is being degenerated? What, what is, you use the word generation, like generative. So something is being generated, it's being created, it's being, being brought into being. So degeneration is something that is there being taken away. And I think the thing that, if you wanted to try to zoom it out as much as possible, I think the thing that's being taken away is borders. This is like the entire progressive yes. movement is yes. a yes. war on borders, a war on yes. national borders, a war on on social borders, a war on conceptual borders. We're distinct. Yes. We're destroying the distinction between men and women. We're destroying yep. the st- distinction between children and adults. We're eliminating borders. And there's a you get really philosophical with this, where this is like a a, a, a platonic impulse toward the one that 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 many is dirty and bad and one is good. So we have to eliminate everything that would point toward any kind of many and we have to only have the one left. But this is almost paradoxically, this is like the, 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 the outworking of the individualism that when you atomize everybody into individual units, then without the borders, without the hierarchy, without the structure, without the ordering, without the, the word you use, without the logos, the meaning that puts them together then all you get a whole bunch of individual isolated atoms that are floating in a big sea of meaningless nothing. And in Lord of Spirits, the, just the, the, the best podcast in the world, um, Father Stephen DeYoung talks about how the word, we, we use the word justice, and to us, we have like a justice system. And so we, we attribute justice to, um, uh, uh, there's like a penal implication to it that justice is about punishment it's about um you know meeting out uh consequences but he said biblically justice to 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 execute justice is to put things in their right order to res- to restore things to the proper order things are out of order and to justify them is like justifying text on a on a on a word document you're justifying you're putting things into the proper order the proper structure so justice is the is like the the antithesis of degeneration or degeneracy you're restoring you're justifying things we're being justified so by participating in the life of christ through his church we are being justified we are being brought into proper order with reality um and then the one other thought that i had was uh talking about archetypes and starting to recognize and see the world through these archetypal lenses for me, at least, it gave me a much deeper appreciation for older cultures because we have this perception, this very Western modern perception of we're, we are at like the cutting edge of human ingenuity, human achievement. We're the smartest, we're the best, we're the brightest. And there's a um, sometimes subtle, sometimes explicit uh, denigration of things that are older. This is really, you could think of this in archetypal terms as this is the child rebelling against his grandparents or against his parents. And we perceive these older cultures as being primitive or backwards or not understanding how the world works. Like, oh, they did a dance to try to get the rain to fall. Like, that's, <laughs> a lot of those things, are, some of them are true, but some of them are, are there's, there's a lot deeper truths there that, in a sense, those cultures understood aspects of reality that we don't, that we've completely lost, we're completely blind to. They had a metaphysical sense that we don't have. That I think we're, my guess is that what's happening through all the kind of upheaval and everything lately is that we, the collective, the royal we, are beginning to, 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 to use an analogy, it's kind of like our metaphysical radar is starting to come back online. And so we're starting to get little pings on the radar and we don't know what to do with them. It's like there's this random ping over here that there we look over there and I, I can't see anything, but the radar says something is right there. So how do I how do I relate to that reality? There's now 
there's a reality overlaying this reality that I didn't realize is there. And now I'm seeing it. So how do I integrate these two realities? How do I, how do I put them in their proper order? How do I justify them? And it turns out that if your goal is to strive for the fulfillment of the individual, then you're going to end up unjustified. You're going to end up out of order. But if your goal is to, is to just be justified by the one, by the Logos, through participation in his life, through his church, then you're going to be able to fully integrate that metaphysical reality with the physical reality and you're going to be put into the proper order. Wow. <laughs> yes. <All> the, yes. <laughs> and... What's up, guys? Your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson here. And you might notice this recording sounds different than the usual podcast. And that is because I'm sitting outside here in Lockhart, Texas, recording this ad into my iPhone. It probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something very cool. Many of you guys know that my production team works over at Podsworth Media, and they've been producing my show for quite a while. I get a lot of questions and people asking, who does your podcast? Why does it sound great? And I'm telling you why. It's because the guys at Podsworth are amazing. They've got this brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this and making them a whole lot cleaner and more listenable with just a few easy clicks. It will remove background noise, it reduces plosives, it fixes clipping, which is distortion from recording with the gain up too high, clipping, which is distortion from recording with the gain up too high, which I can promise you I've done many times, and they fixed this for me. It removes clicks and pops, it removes clicks and pops and then also levels out the dialogue so there's no crazy where the guest sounds too loud or the interviewer sounds too quiet here's what you guys can do all of y'all that are interested in recording podcasts or audiobooks or anything if you're a pastor and you want your sermon recorded whatever the case may be go to podsworth.com and click get started you drag and drop your audio files or click to open your file manager this also works on your smartphone's web browser you customize your settings that you want, but the default works fine on most podcast recordings. Then enter code BUCK50, B-U-C-K-5-0 for 50% off of your first order. You don't need an account, just an email address and payment. And you'll get a download link in your email for your cleaned up files. How cool is this? The guys at Podsworth run everything they do through this app before they do anything else to it. So all of my recordings go through this app that we're talking about. It works great. Like I said, any spoken word recordings, obviously for podcasts, YouTube videos, sermons, audiobooks, whatever, it will make awful recordings sound listenable and much more professional. So like I said, go to podsworth.com and click get started. You can use promo code BUCK50, B-U-C-K-5-0 for 50% off of your first order. You can use promo code BUCK50, B-U-C-K-5-0 for 50% off of your first order. Let's get it. Um, <laughs> I, I, that was music to her ears, I know. Um, she, she, she has a very good um, rant, if I can get her into it, also on, and it has to do with the removal of boundaries and, and the liberal progressive, which, as we've noted earlier, libertarian is still on that same map, we can say there's still an area that they're on that's basically part of a broader liberal culture, uh, destroying beauty and, and making things that are old try to go away and things that are new, oh, that's, that's beautiful. This new architecture is better. Um, and I know you have a lot of feelings on that, Julie, as well. And it kind of fits yeah. into where we're, what we're talking about. Yeah, I think that modern architecture, which is very, flat, boxy, often like asymmetrical even, um, is a really good visual representation of the modern ethos, which is this flattening and removal of distinction, right? So one of the things that kept me living in San Francisco for so long was the absolutely beautiful architecture that I was surrounded by every day is full of Victorians. And the thing you notice about the old architecture built in the 1800s is there's distinction. There's a column here and a cherub there. And 
and filigree here and there's corbels and there's like all these distinct elements on the Victorians that give them texture. And one thing is not like the other, right? There's like a lion head here or sun ray there. Like it's just, you're like, it's like you're in an open air art museum in that city because there's just so much to look at. You look and look and look and look and there's so much um, distinction and beauty in these Victorians. And if you, I mean, contrast an image of a, in a, you know, a 1800s built Victorian with a modern home, um, something built recently, or even like those big apartment complexes that are going up in cities like Austin or Nashville, um, where they're just flat boxes and there's no texture, right? It's like when you remove, I, 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 there's a lot going on there, but it's like, we're like allergic to distinctions now because it might be offensive, right? So if things are distinct, mm -hmm. there's the yeah. opportunity for something to, when something's defined, someone might be offended. You see this in modern art sculptures all the time too. Like the modern art that goes up is indistinct and they're tearing down statues that are of distinct figures, people who had definition, who stood for something and stood against something else, right? So um, it's subjectivity versus objectivity. They objectively stood for something, and then postmodern yes. sense um, is it's subjective. So it's really if you're objective, that's when the the boundaries and and the offense to someone else comes in. If it's subjective, well. It's just whatever they think it is. So, you know, let them do them. And they're not hurting anyone with those thoughts. It's, I think we, we can tie it back into that same kind of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even Matt was talking about getting rid of borders. It's all like, that's all the, to have distinction, you need a border between two things, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what gives it definition. Um, and I think there was something like paradoxical for me about, under about, because I used to be like an open borders libertarian. And I mean that like, in the national sense, but also it applies to a lot of different things. But I started to realize, especially living in San Francisco, that um, the only place I was truly safe was in the walls of my home. Because when I got on streets, it was, there was like chaos and tons of disorder. And my walls of my home set order to my space and made it safe and free. So paradoxically, to be free, I needed a border, right? And you think, when you think about freedom, you think I need to get rid of borders and boundaries. That's what freedom is to unchain, right? Um, but no, you want borders, you want the right borders. Um, like he's saying, they have to be justified and like properly set in the right place. Um, yeah, I don't know. How does, how does orthodoxy really. give us that? Because I think we can tie it in very easily. I mean, I don't know, maybe Matt wants to, could speak more eloquently to that than I can. Um, you, but you, you highlighted something there that, that uh, hit me right between the eyes. You were, what did you say? You said, we don't, we're, we're allergic to distinctions because the distinctions might offend. might offend. The distinctions are, are, the distinctions reveal the truth. Because if the, when, when you see the distinction, you, when, when you have a distinction, then you have a way of comparing this thing to this thing. So the distinctions are um, a, a tool that you use to be able to evaluate the world. So the truth is borne out in distinctions and seeing distinctions. And I thought of the verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active. The word of God, so the word of God being, as a coming from a Protestant background, I was like, oh, the Bible. Mm -hmm. The word of God is, the word of the Lord is the Logos, is Christ. Mm -hmm. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The, the tr so the distinctions reveal the truth, or you might say that the truth reveals the distinctions. And the truth, who is the truth? The way, the truth, and the life. So Christ is the truth. Christ is the word of God that, that divides, that, that indicates these distinctions. And so this war on distinctions is quite literally a war on Christ. Mm -hmm. It's a war on the truth. And on creation, because you, can't, mm -hmm. you literally can't have creation without distinction. A leaf is yes. not a stick. A dog is not a cat, right? Like that, you can't have, this is also the thing with Buddhism is it's trying to get you back into that uncreated soup of like, of nothing, right? You, 
anyway, sorry to interject, but yeah, no, 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 that's that perfect. Much. That's perfect. Yeah, because it this uh, yeah, I keep coming back to this the, the, this war on distinctions, this war on borders is this this um, neoplatonic neo neoplatonic demonic spirit of 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 antichrist this is an antichrist spirit that is is uh it, it's quite literally warring on truth it's warring on the distinctions the borders the um the 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 ability to even encounter reality to even perceive reality and the What's interesting is the, the verses that, that go on right after that. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to what we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way that we are yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive great, we may, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The, the I don't want to go super technical with some of this stuff because I'm not I'm going to get myself lost in it. But the 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 beauty of the Trinity is that it's foundationally re- relational. That the foundation of reality is a relationship. It's a relationship between loving persons who love one another. And if you eliminate the ability to perceive the truth, if you eliminate the ability to um, to have borders, to have distinctions, to have differentiations. There are distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are distinctions that we can pick out. There, it's one God in three persons. So you you have the the um the the transcendence of unity versus multiplicity. There isn't this. There isn't a tension. There isn't a a dialectic uh, war between the two of them. You have one in three, and that that one. So the the, the Buddhists are are on the oneness side. They're like, no, multiplicity is bad and wrong. Get rid of it all. Wipe out all the borders. Remove all the distinctions. This destroys the ability to perceive and access truth. The flip side of it would be individualism, which is every every single individual atomized thing is what's real. And there is, you cannot have a, you can't lump people together in groups. Collectivism is evil and bad. You can't lump people together into groups because then you're destroying their 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 uniqueness. That this is this is erring on the other side, where now you're destroying again in a similar way. You're destroying the ability to perceive truth, to access truth, which fundamentally truth is a relationship. Is a truth is a person with whom you can have a relationship, with whom you can exist in a relationship, and that relationship is going to expose you. The Hell, I had this conversation with a friend of mine that hell is being in the presence of God while clinging to your sin. Because if you are in the presence of God clinging to your sin, sin cannot exist in his presence. It will be destroyed. And if you're clinging to it, you will be destroyed as well. The experience of hell is being in the personal presence of almighty God while clinging to your sin, while being identified with your sin. The word of God will separate you from your sin. It will, it, will, it will cut through and it will part you from your sin so that you can exist in that relationship, which is that relationship is the foundation of reality. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. You just hit on something that there's so many things after now being in the Orthodox Church since I can't do the math really quick, but since October 2021, um, where I hear them or experience them or read them and I go, why didn't someone explain this phenomenon this way before I got here? And it's not that I'm bitter or mad about it. It's just like, man, this is put, um, just the way you described hell. This has put this topic in a light, no pun intended, that I've never seen it in before. Where has this been? Uh, Julie, did you have things like that where you learn something and you're like, wait a second, this is not how I was taught it. And I don't mean that it's wrong in orthodoxy. I mean, I, I think literally orthodox means correct. Uh, it, Julie, what are those things for you? It was the faith and works polarized argument in the West. Um, cause when I looked into Luther and like the Protestant Reformation, um, a big 
a crucial like inflection point of that whole thing was the idea that we're saved by faith alone versus the like emphasis on works, right? And then the or, and when I looked into this, so, so the you know, uh, I guess so soteriology of like how we're saved, um, and the West has this like polarized um, kind of argument going on about it. It's faith alone. No, it's faith and works or or, I don't know. I think Catholics kind of emphasize the works part. Protestants obviously emphasize faith alone. But then I looked into how Orthodox talk about this issue and it's just not, it's like this third middle way and, and they talk about, and we always say this within Orthodoxy, it's it's both. Yeah. And and they talk about theosis, like participating in God's and it's like, they're like married, right? They're not polarized. It's not one or the other. Um, so looking into that was, uh, yeah, probably one of those main things that I was like, no one's ever explained it to me this way. And, and, and prior to yeah. 500 or so years ago, no one ever discussed it in, in this manner. Like yeah. to discuss it, like, well, is it faith or is it works? No one even yeah. had that debate prior to 500 years ago. This is a very, in the grand scheme of things, modern way to discuss Christianity. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Matt, I'll let you chime in. Yeah, they're they're uh, they're they're doing this same thing, this this Western atomization thing, where um, like like Catholics do with with uh, communion, where they they they're trying to. It's like it's like you need to drill down to to understand these things. You need to drill down to a certain level, but not any further. And if you keep drilling down further and further then you're, you begin separating things that can't be separated. So you're, so the flip side of, of um, generating borders is that you can't generate so many that you destroy the concept of, of, of meaning. So, so again, on the oneness side, you have all borders. And on the many side, the, the, the multiplicity side, you have like nothing but borders. And neither one of those things work because if everything is borders, nothing is borders. And if nothing is borders, everything is borders. So the, with the faith and works thing, it's, it's, you have, um, it isn't faith and works. It's that, f- it's that you're, you're looking at the same thing. The faith is the works. The works is the faith. They're, they're the, you can't separate them from each other. I, w- I would, I've never done this because I just generally don't get combative with people like this, but I really would like to hear a, Protestant answer the question is having faith a work <laughs> right or <laughs> because, is it a thought right and and if it's a thought is thinking that thought a work like is, mm-hmm. is, am I supposed to when you say well you, you you don't need to do any works you just need to have faith okay so having faith is so to have faith that's what I, I believe oh yeah yeah you have to believe believe in the Lord Jesus Christ okay so the act of believing is that a work yeah. And if it's not, why not? I'd, I'd be very curious to hear how they how they respond to that because it's it's you can't you can't separate. We we talk in the the like libertarian side of things. You get this the socialist side of things, especially the the whole praxis idea. Um, there has to be a praxis, and and it, it, it's like you you can't if you're going to talk about belief, you're necessarily implying action because if there's no action, there's no belief. What I believe is revealed in the things that I do. When, yes. I, when I take a step, it's because I believe that there's something for me to step forward onto. Yes. So the act of, so me doing something, me taking an action reveals what I believe. Yes. If, if I say I believe something, but it's not revealed in the way that I'm acting, then I don't actually believe it. I just think it. I think this distinction between thinking and belief is, is, we've we've kind of lost this in our culture there isn't the we, we've kind of conflate these things that thinking and belief for sort of the same things but belief is an is a um belief is not a passive verb it's an active verb yes and it necessarily implies works yes and it's really that's also a Misesian um framework which i uh, one of the things mm. i learned from libertarianism was austrian economics and the mises human action we can look at economics by just watching when people do this that shows you what they value. It doesn't matter what they say or write down. It literally is what they do shows you what they think and value despite what they could say. Um, revealed preference. Revealed preference, correct. Um, 
Do you, do either one of you describe yourself politically with a label anymore? Christian. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's like, I would maybe be comfortable with like traditionalist, but even that it's like, well, which tradition? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. Probably not. I'm, do either think, one of you think libertarianism as a legal framework philosophy could work on an extremely small level? A small group of religious people, maybe. <laughs> I, don't know. I think I think the only way that it would work would be um, not explicitly. It would have to be like the minute that you tried to formalize it, or or um, uh, the, the minute you tried to write a libertarian constitution, you're going to kill it. It has mm -hmm. to be something that's that's organic in the way that people naturally react and relate to one another but even mm -hmm. then the uh the 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 no true libertarians person is not going to recognize a libertarian a person who calls themselves libertarian would not want to live in an actually libertarian society i said that even when i could call myself a libertarian for a long time i, I would you'd read hans herman hoppe and get that view of libertarianism which was closest to the one i valued and i would think i don't know a lot of the people i lit know won't want to live in this this group this co-op whatever you want to call it this this small sect for sure i kind of feel like i lived in a libertarian society in san francisco like i yeah. always say this to people I'm like it's a very libertarian place um and in a lot of ways libertarianism is like almost indistinguishable from like progressive leftism like their, their fruits are the same um hmm. which i think is why people are confused when i say that san francisco is libertarian but it is and living in it is awful <laughs> <laughs> It was terrible. And then, uh, then people are fleeing, right? And it's very easy to be a libertarian. I always said this with my friends who were like, thought we shouldn't have police. Like, it's really easy to sit there in a society that has police protecting you and say, we don't need police. Yes. It's like, you're, it's like the fish doesn't see the water, right? It's like... It's not, I said that it, so many yeah. times, the same thing. It gives you this uh, cover to hide underneath because you could say, well... Here's the perfect society. It would be function like this, but without ever having had that or probably never going to have that, it's, it's a theoretical point that you can't be proven wrong in a sense, except unless you look at the world around you. And, and some of us might say that is proving you wrong, but it's easy to hide under this cover like, well, I'm just an anarchist. I'll go be alone in the woods. And it's like, yeah, but you're not going to do that. So just saying that means nothing. In other words, and Pete uh, Quinones, a mutual friend of Matt and mine, has would get in this argument, like, look, we're discussing, like, for instance, the school system and why it's bad. And the classic libertarian will just say, well, abolish public schools. And it's like, okay, well, that's not, an, uh, that's not a helpful answer at the moment to abolish all public schools. That's not going to happen unless society well, collapses so that you're offering nothing by, and, and it's giving you this safe place to hide. Like I said my part, I said the right thing. And now I'm, you're all wrong. <laughs> You know, and it's like a lot of libertarianism is internally logically consistent, but then you can't witness the empirical evidence of how it plays out, mm. right? So you get stuck there because, like, well, if we just did this, and it's all like, yeah, theoretical, and it sounds logically consistent. And this was actually like I was a uh, feminist and left wing and libertarian, and then I moved to San Francisco, and it was like seeing how those values play out and what kind of society they create made me go, oh, this is all wrong, right? And but if you can't ever live it out. Um, or test it. I don't know. And because I guess it sounds yeah a little it, bit like well, real communism has never been tried. But um, if you do yeah. try to, even if you had a a strictly libertarian framework, legal framework in a society, unfortunately, if there are evil people or evil spirits inhabiting inhibiting inhabiting, how do you ever say that? Ha inhabiting people, it's going to give them this safe room to not violate the NAP, and for those listening who, what do they keep saying? The non-aggression principle, which is the core foundation of libertarianism, meaning don't hurt people, don't take their things for lack of a, a deeper in insight to it. But it gives you this legal framework to where bad people, bad elements of society can quote unquote, not violate the NAP, but yet degrade your entire culture and society and never have swung a fist at you, never have shot a gun at you, never have stolen your money, or your house or anything else, but you can look in this culture and it's ruined. It's depleted. It's gone. And no one violated the nap, but now your life looks like shit 
because that's yeah. why we can look at this map and see San Francisco, Northern California. It's probably the most beautiful place in this entire country before this societal degradation happened. And now go look at it. And people are leaving it because of the exactly what we're talking about. It's had the most outflux of population in the last three years. That's people literally leaving the most beautiful place in the country because the society and the social culture is garbage. Violence is not the only form of harm. This is what libertarians get wrong, right? Like I was deeply hurt by living in that libertarian society, but it was like spiritual hurt and like, and, and ways that my life wasn't generating in positive ways. Like, but I, no one laid a hand on me. Well, except for the homeless guy that threw a cigarette in my face one. <laughs> so stuff like that does happen. But I'm just saying like, um, the, libertarians don't understand that harm is myriad. It manifests in myriad ways. It's not just violence or theft, right? It's not just, it's almost like they have a too materialistic view of harm because they think it's like physical hurt or stealing your stuff. And it's like, you can hurt somebody spiritually, emotionally, like much then, worse, really. Yeah. 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 Worse in many ways. The, too narrow. One of the things that our society is suffering from is, um, an absence of approved violence, an absence of socially approved violence. Because Based. if you have a society that tries to, if you have a society that tries to eliminate all forms of violence, then kind of paradoxically, you're going to get un, uninhibited violence. So, I mean, people kind of, kind of hint at this when they say things like, um, you know, that's a guy who's never been hit in the face before. Like, he, yes. he, like he's someone who needs to get hit in the face because... There's just certain things that you can't, you can't function in a, in a, in, you can't function in a society with people who don't know how to function in a society. And part of functioning in a society is getting hit in the face when you deserve to be hit in the face. Because there's, like you're saying, Julie, there's a, there's a, um, there's a metaphysical reality and a physical reality. And, and you can't isolate both. You, you can't isolate just one of those things and act as if, Actions in what in just the physical reality are all that matter. That the metaphysical reality doesn't matter. We need we the society would be much less. I could make sure I actually am not like getting you flagged for advocating violence or something. The society with dueling and um, organized accepted forms of of uh, the V word. Are mm -hmm. are gonna be much more peaceful societies? It's just yes. If you, I mean, if you even if you think of it, just I, I like to do this where I just boil it down to like I imagine a tribe of people sitting around a campfire. There's like they don't know where the nearest people are. For all they know, they're the only people on the continent. How are they going to naturally organize and structure their social interactions? If you if you took a, a people like that, because this is what the the libertarians will do is they'll say um you know, like the, the, the public school things. Oh, just abolish the public school system. We live in an existing society. You're not, we, it's not like we can wake up tomorrow and snap our fingers and start off just clean blank slate, just like, yeah. like, a, like a computer game that we're building up from the ground up. We live in an existing society and there's going to be effects to every single thing that you do. So you can make a really compelling case that abolishing the welfare state would be a, a form of aggression against the people who depend upon the welfare state. Just abolishing it overnight and saying, yeah, go fend for yourselves is it, 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 it takes an, an extremely high level of of autism in the bad sense to, <laughs> to not recognize how catastrophic that would be and how cruel it would be to people. So if you imagine people just sitting around their campfire and they're building up their 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 way their society is going to function. If you said, okay, we're going we're gonna to build our society around the non-aggression principle, so you can't hurt people and you can't take their stuff, then another neighboring tribe comes and is near them doing stuff, and you're like, oh, we can't, we can't do anything to them because we can't hurt them, we can't take their stuff, but then we can let them like establish themselves all around us so they haven't stepped foot on our property. They're going to establish themselves all around us, and then they can come start, I don't know, using propaganda or whatever other thing Having orgies you're never, basically in front of your children. I mean, really, right, right? Right, yeah. And you're like, oh, well, they haven't violated the non-aggression principle, so we don't like, 
This is a completely asinine way to try to imagine how a human society could function. It's just, it's, it's never going to happen. You're not going to build a human society. You're not going to take the existing society and port it to a nap-friendly society. And you're not going to start a society from the ground up as a nap-friendly society. Neither one is ever going to happen. The problem with the libertarian view of the world is it doesn't take into consideration the fact that there are people in the world. Mm-hmm. That's, they just <laughs> Much like the socialist and communist version. Mm-hmm. Same, mm-hmm. same, and we saw how that worked out. You know, um, they have to eliminate the people that you know mm-hmm. they created martyrs. Um, I've kept you guys for this has been one of the most fun conversations though in a long time for an hour twenty. Um, I guess we can wrap it up. You got you both have shows that need to be out on a more regular basis as well. By the way. <laughs> um, Julie, Guilty. I'll I'll let you plug anything you'd like before we get out of here. Let me let me actually before we get to that, I, I want closing remarks from both of you on a quick kind of a summation of what Orthodox Christianity has either shown you, done for your life, given you, whatever you'd like to say in, in, in that type of space. And I'll let you go first, Matt. Mm. I should also say I for, a big question. It is a big question. And for my <laughs> priests, friends listening, and to my uber Orthodox friends listening, I understand it's not about what it can give you. So I phrased that question in a certain way, but I, I think you all understand what I mean. Don't be an autist, but uh, go ahead, Matt. <laughs> I love that you just told your priest friends not to be autistic. I don't mean them. I don't mean them. Just, okay. just my reader friends, the readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm. Um, it, for me, it has given me a context for everything. It's given me a context for history, a context for culture, um, a context for family, a context for 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 my own life. It's it's been a um, it, it's it's helped me to understand my own role in my relationships with other people and the trajectory of history and the, the role that each of us plays in um, manifesting reality to use kind of a, a, a new agey phrase. But I think it's, it's very true that we're, there is a sense in which we are creating the world in real time in cooperation with Christ and um, whether we realize it or not. So sin, sin entered the world through man. Man created this aspect of the world and God in his infinite love permitted us to do that because he's given us free will. So that, that free will works, can work both directions. It can work for the good or can work for the evil. and we know how the story ends, but, um, or not even, but we know how the story ends. And <laughs> part of, part of that trajectory, part of that ending is us, um, recognizing th- our responsibility to, um, exercise dominion over nature and over ourselves and, uh, to cooperate with Christ in, um, bringing the truth into reality. Well put. Uh, Julie, a, I, I know you want to follow that. Um, uh, that's a beautiful answer that I don't know if I can follow. Like every everything Matt said resonates and he said it really beautifully. I guess the only thing I would add is like, it's also given me this like eternal perspective in the sense of not, of thinking of like my life and actions from a perspective of um, Mm. what will come after death, if that makes sense. Like, it allows me to deal with death in a different way and to not mm. be afraid of it because, um, and, and and that just, thinking about eternity has it gives my life a different meaning and guides my behavior in ways that if all there is is this realm. And I think Matt beautifully spoke to how we like co-create with God on this realm and we can manifest. I mean, we want to be like, experiencing heaven on earth and working towards that. Um, but also 
thinking about um like life after death has been helpful because it it not only guides my actions in this realm and gives them like a deeper meaning um but also it gives me hope that will never be taken from me until the day i die if that makes sense yes. instead of looking at old age as like now I don't have energy and I can't do as much mm-hmm. and I can't create as much, right? Um, I can look at it as like I'm hopefully, God willing, closer to a new kingdom. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yes. Yeah. I, I, and, and kind of on that note, I think the concept of theosis would be one of those things I think I discovered in orthodoxy and I thought, why doesn't anyone else talk about this? It's key. I mean, it's, it's key. Um, it is beautiful. It is that mm-hmm. as well. Let's... Uh, Talk, let's plug away, really. Talk about Amy, I'm mean, excuse me, <laughs> your sister. Yep. Julie and Amy have a show that uh, we need to see more of. Yeah, we have a pod. I don't, I don't have that much to plug. Um, we have the Mystic Sisters Substack and podcast, but it's due for new episodes. It is. Um, I'd like to revive it um, and roughly plan to, but there's a lot of good episodes on there that people can dig into. And Twitter, um, Twitter, all then, sized. Yeah my, you, you. yeah, my Twitter is Julie Writes, and I'm active on there. And then um, I also write about media bias at allsides.com and political narratives in the press and how that, and kind of untangling those and how that manifests. Can just for our, uh, I thought it was funny. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it if you haven't written about it yet, but before we started recording, you talked about something that just came across your desk about a certain. I think it was Bing. Could we talk about that at all? Just in closing, oh, yeah. just as an example yes. of what you do. This is fascinating yes. to me. Yeah, so we rate the bias of media outlets. And lately, my team has been applying our media bias ratings to uh, news aggregators. So Bing News, Google News, they're basically home pages. I don't know if anybody listening uses them, but it's a home page of news curation. We've been applying our bias ratings to these uh, tech platforms that are curating news and looking at are they curating more left or right media? And we found huge bias in Google News. They're showing people left media to a sh- strong degree more. They're biased to the left. And we just did one of Bing News that bound 0% conservative outlets on Bing News um, over a two-week period. So you're almost exclusively getting a left view. Google wasn't quite as bad. It was still bad. Um, so, Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting analysis just to show how you're getting a one-sided perspective from these tech companies. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that you could outleft Google, but being managed to do so, that's wild. Yes, actually surprising, yeah. I and think Google gets, sorry, this could be a whole different podcast. I think Google gets some pressure, more pressure maybe to deal with bias. I don't think they're dealing with it well. Um, Bing kind of goes under the radar. Were you in charge of, I know you do a lot of the media bias rating, like the flow chart or whatever you want to call it, but there was uh, one that came out from all sides that rated counterflowpodcast.com mostly based. We're... <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Matt, I don't know. You're not going to be able to follow that hilarious joke, but plug away. <laughs> plug the King Pill show. Where are you at with that? Oh, I am. I am at... Uh, just had so much going on lately that it just i just haven't had the bandwidth for it um turns out uh going through lent building up yeah. to getting baptized is is kind of a uh uh spiritually and emotionally heavy experience so um and physically you got ill as well yeah yeah i've still got uh <laughs> the damn cedar trees in texas have now um inflicted their 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 poisons on me so i've got allergies constantly and yeah anyway so uh nobody cares about my 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 mucus <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so uh i uh, yeah king pilled is the show uh is on youtube right now uh there's a whole bunch of episodes there that you can go listen to um i think some of them are, are, are pretty interesting and then uh i've got a list of people who have either agreed to come on the show or who um, I need to ask to come on the show, but I think I'm pretty pretty sure going to get them. And I've, it's like probably like 15 people long. So nice. I need to I need to, to to get my act together and and, and start uh, setting up some of those interviews. Yes, um, I, Julie and I, I both said we would do it, so that you're you're good. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I am in awe of of Buck's consistency and uh, his ability to crank these out and uh, fantastic interviewer. 
Oh, thanks. Um, Agreed. Yeah, so so King Pilled on YouTube, uh, uh, Real King Pilled on Twitter. Um, I haven't been super active there lately just because kind of a lot of the same things. I just I just haven't had anything to say. It's all the stuff that's been going on in my head is just um, for my head only, I guess. So, <laughs> um, but now that we're through, we're 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 through Lent, and uh, we're we're part of the way through Holy Week here, and uh, we're building up to Pascha. Yeah. Saturday night is going to be a a, a treat. It's yes. also going to be a chore with a um, very active two and a half year old. Um, so we're we're building up to that, and uh, once I get through that, then I think that it's going to kind of take some uh, a bit of a weight off my shoulders, and I'm hoping to get some more episodes out here soon. So. So King Pilled on YouTube, Rook King Pilled on Twitter. That's where that's where you can find me. Speaking of two and a half year old and, and your Twitter, is it your Twitter profile that says father to a perfect son? Mm-hmm. I would agree. I saw, I read that the other day and I was like, <laughs> I agree. He is the best. Um, Matt, Julie, thank you guys for being on Counterflow and helping me be part of cranking these constantly out and being consistent. I need guests. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you. It's a thank pleasure. You. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that great conversation with Julie and Matt. I'm so thankful they could do this. And let's see, like I said, David Gronoski is the Zoom call guest this month. Patreon.com slash counterflow. $5 or more per month gets you right in there and you can have a good discussion amongst the other Patreons and David Gronoski and myself. It's going to be fun. Looking forward to that. As for this show, you know, counterflowpodcast.com. Go to YouTube, hit subscribe to the channel there. We're getting more and more views on there. And I like that. I've started to want to see the interviews more so than just listen to them. And that's on all the shows I listen to. I enjoy that format. So, of course, we're on Rumble, Odyssey, all of that as well. And we got the Telegram group going strong. Let's see. I think that's about all I have for y'all this week. Have a wonderful, bright week. We'll talk to y'all soon. Bye. Hologram graph, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.